And then there's molecular biology. Molecular biology involves sequencing the genomes, the DNA, and the proteins, the proteome, of different organisms and seeing how similar they are to each other on the assumption that the more similar two organisms' DNA or the more similar their proteins, the more closely related they'll be. Now, it's getting pretty trendy these days to take a home DNA test. You send away to a company, they mail you a tube, you spit into the tube, and you mail it back to them. They sequence all of the DNA that they find inside your saliva, and they tell you, oh, you have this many first cousins in this area. You have, uh, you came from this uh, ancestry in these regions. Uh, you're prone to these kinds of diseases because of your genome. Now, the way that we check to see how closely related two different species are is actually much the same. So how does DNA tests work? Well, let's say a whole bunch of people in my family take a DNA test. There's me, there's my brother, there's my first cousin, then there's my first cousin once removed. First cousin once removed. If we take this DNA test, we would find that the two most closely related individuals are my brother and I. We have the most similar DNA of anyone in this group, and the reason why we have similar DNA is our DNA came from the same source. We have parents. We have the same parents. We share a common ancestor, right? A recent common ancestor, and therefore we have similar DNA to each other. The further back in history two organisms share a common ancestor, the more different they're going to be because of mutation. Mutations are random, so in different family lines you're going to get more and more and more different mutations building up over time. Two organisms would be very similar if they shared recent common ancestry, but if their common ancestry is a hundred million years ago, they're going to be pretty different by now. My first cousins, they're going to be pretty similar to my brother and I, but not quite the same. If we go a little bit further back, my first cousins and I are going to share grandparents. So we're more distantly related because we share an ancestor, a common ancestor, further back in history. My first cousins, once removed, will still be genetically similar to me, but even more distantly related because we share great-grandparents. We can apply this same idea, but we can genetically sequence every single organism on the planet and put them all into one big family tree. If organisms were fundamentally not related to each other, that is, they were all created exactly as they are right now, there's no reason why their genetic codes would be similar to each other. There's no reason why they would even share a genetic code in common. Why can E. coli bacteria take one of my genes, say for making insulin, and translate it out to make human insulin? Why does it know that language? Because we're genetically similar enough, at least on that level. So if we apply this idea to every organism on the planet, that any two organisms that share a lot of DNA in common, that have very similar DNA, have recent common ancestry, and any organisms that are more distantly related to each other will have more distant common ancestry, that will have less similar DNA, we get what we call phylogenetic trees. You may have heard that human beings and chimpanzees share over 98% of our genes in common, and that is true. Most of the genes that you find inside the human genome, you also find inside chimpanzees and bonobos. Bonobos are a related species to chimpanzees. They're called dwarf chimpanzees. Now, we don't have all of our genes in common. There's a few genes that we have that chimpanzees don't, and a few genes that chimpanzees have that we do not possess. Humans did not come from chimpanzees. This is another misconception about evolution. We didn't go from monkeys to chimpanzees to humans. All we're saying is that at some point in history, these two species shared common ancestry, and that common ancestor was not a chimpanzee, and it was not a human. It was something else, similar, but different from those two organisms. Chimpanzee DNA and human DNA is similar enough that if you take it and you mix it together and you stir it up, the double helixes will sometimes 
come apart from each other and human DNA will line up with chimpanzee DNA and they will zip themselves up nice and tight. The sequence of A's, T's, C's, and G's is similar enough that they can actually hydrogen bond with each other. They can zip up pretty darn comfortably as though that is another member of the same species because they're very closely related. Now, again, we're not perfectly related. For example, chimpanzees have two additional chromosomes compared to humans. But if we sequence those chromosomes, we find one of the chromosomes that humans have is actually a combination of those first two. At some point, they just kind of got linked together. And we've seen this happen under lab conditions. We know that that's something that can occur. Well, on this chart, chimpanzees, evolutionarily speaking, are kind of like our siblings, right? They're, we're both highly evolved organisms which share a recent common ancestor. And then if you go to other members of the great ape family, you go to gorillas or orangutans, you will find that they are still over 96% related to us. Individual humans have different DNA from each other, but if you sequence the genomes of any two humans, they're going to be 99.9% .9 identical. We have most of the same genes in common, 0.1% difference. That's what makes you different from any other member of our species. The difference between a human and a chimpanzee is closer to 1.2%. If we extend this idea to another member of the great ape family, say gorillas, humans and gorillas share 98.4% of their genetic material in common. That is, if you look at any given sequence of letters inside human genomes and gorilla genomes, there is a 98.4% chance that any given letter will be the same between those two organisms. But it doesn't stop there. You could extend this idea to other members of the primate order gibbons and capuchin monkeys and that sort of thing. And we would find that we are very similarly related to them as well, more similarly related to them than we would be to say another mammal, for example, a dog, right? Uh, and then if you were to take all mammals, you would find that they are very similar to each other, but they're also pretty closely related to fish and birds and lizards and these sorts of things. If I were to sequence the genome of Sir Patrick Stewart, who will be my representative homo sapien for this particular slide, I would find that he has 70% of his genome in common with this banana slug right here. They're both animals, and animal cells are all fundamentally kind of similar to each other, so it makes sense that they would have the same kinds of genes, 70% similarity. But I could look at other kingdoms as well. I could sequence Patrick Stewart and compare him to a banana tree, and I would find that Patrick Stewart and a banana share about 50% of their genes in common. So the fact that any two organisms are going to share genetic similarities to each other tells us that all organisms on the planet are fundamentally related on a certain level, that they all descended from common ancestry. At some point, there was a living organism on planet Earth that was the ancestor of all modern living organisms. We call that organism the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA. LUCA is not the first cell. It's not the first organism. LUCA is the most recent organism that is related to every single living organism today, be it a fungi, or a human being, or a barn owl, or a koala bear. LUCA is related to all of them. Even on the most basic chemical level, all life shares certain similarities together. All cells have a plasma membrane with relatively the same construction. All cells use DNA as their genetic material, and they use the same four bases of DNA. They use A, T, C, and G. There's no reason why those have to be the four nucleotides used in DNA. You could make other kinds of nucleotides. Every organism on the planet uses the same genetic code. You remember when we were doing translation problems and AUG translated over to methionine. That is true for humans, it's true for plants, it's true for fungi, it's true for bacteria, it's true for archaea, which is another kind of single-cell prokaryotic organism. All life on planet recognizes the same genetic code. So again, you could take genes from a human, give them to an Escherichia coli bacterium, and that bacterium would know how to read it and it would make human-like proteins for us, which is how we make insulin.
if we look at just the molecular evidence and all of the evidence we have from the fossil record and all this, what it tells us is that all of life is related to each other and is part of one massive family tree. There was a period of time where there was a lot of arguing about the development of life over time, how genes are passed on and how natural selection works. Natural selection got kind of popular for a little bit, but then there was a backlash against it. There was what we call the eclipse of Darwinism, when Mendel's research really started to get shining through. So you had guys like Hugo de Vries and Reginald Punnett saying, no, Mendel has his finger on the very pulse of how genes are passed on from generation to generation. This Darwin guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's the genetics that's important. But then there were other scientists like Thomas Hunt Morgan, who were studying this idea of mutation, of new traits showing up because genes change over time, because mutations occur and the DNA changes over time, and that's how you get new traits. So what is it? Is it mutation? Is that how we get new species? Is it genetics? Are we just shuffling around the genes that are already there? Is it natural selection, deciding which kinds of traits are useful or not useful to reproduction? It's all three of them. We've put those three ideas together in what we call the modern synthesis. The modern synthesis combines all three of these ideas that we've discussed, mutation, genetics, and evolution by natural selection. Where do new traits come from? Mutations to DNA cause slight changes in the sequence of nucleotides. That slight change in the sequence of nucleotides changes the expression of proteins at the end of translation. Changing the expression of proteins alters what kinds of traits organisms are going to display. So you get new kinds of traits showing up in populations thanks to mutation. Now that alone should tell you that organisms do change over time because mutation causes new traits to emerge that weren't there before so the population will continue to change as it moves forward. But we can go further. Genetics shows us how traits can be passed on from generation to generation and continue to show up in the population in small amounts even if it's not the most common trait in that area. For a while, Darwin was having trouble figuring out how natural selection could actually push organisms in a certain direction because of a problem called regression to the mean. Let's say that you had an organism that was exceptionally fast. It's a very, very fast rabbit for example. And that rabbit, man, it's got an advantage because it can get away from predators and it can scoot all over the place. It can go into different areas and find lots of mates and be able to breed and have lots of offspring. It's got a big advantage. But those mates that it's finding, they are probably not as fast as this extremely fast rabbit. So wouldn't that speed kind of average out between the two parents and then you would have less fast offspring? That's a problem. But Mendel's work shows us how this could happen, that you could have genes for speed which then get propagated out into the population and it's not going to be reduced, it's not going to be diluted by the rest of the gene pool, it's just going to add to the variety there. Mutation tells us how new genes show up, how new traits emerge. Genetics show us how they are passed to members of the population, how they propagate from generation to generation. And then evolution by natural selection tells us how those genes compete against one another and how successful reproducers are going to contribute more of their genetic information to the next generation. So those genes are going to increase in the next generation's gene pool. This is what we call the modern synthesis. All of these ideas knitted together perfectly reinforcing one another and supported by every scrap of evidence that we currently have.